This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brad Cresswell, and joining me in the studio today are the Toledo Symphony's president and CEO, Zach Vassar. We also have two other members of the Toledo Symphony staff, one of them who has been here many times. That is our good friend, Mickey M. Hello, Mickey. And also a first-time Symphony Labber. That would be Elizabeth Fogel. Welcome to you both. Thank you. And we have a special phone guest. That is, and I, I do have a little fanfare for you. Please welcome mezzo-soprano Nina Yoshida Nelson, who joins us by phone. Hello, Nina. Hey, thanks for having me. The reason that we're talking with you is because you're performing with the Toledo Symphony. Uh, Some of the songs of Alma Mahler, it's on a program called Women in Classical Music. That that's an entire issue unto itself, and we can talk about that a little bit, and we'll drill down into Alma Mahler and the songs that you're bringing to the peristyle. But it's happening on Friday at 8 p.m., that's March 3rd, at the Toledo Museum of Art Peristyle. You can find more information at ToledoSymphony.com or call the box office 419-246-8000. Nina is joined by the conductor Daniela Candelari, and we have music besides Alma Mahler on the program. We'll hear a new work by Jesse Montgomery, also music of Louise Ferenc. So it's a really interesting program. Now, I just want to notice uh, before we get any further that this is kind of a singer's panel, except for Zach, because we're all singers here, except for you. I, well, I mean, I you do sing a case. sang in a choir when I was in college. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you, we'll count you as a singer. Maybe for the day. <laughs> for the day. Singer for a day. I was thinking of um, something Merwin wrote to me in one of his emails, like what would be the collective noun for singers? Like, yeah, you know, it's a gaggle. A gaggle of singers? A gargle, maybe a gargle. A a gargoyle of singers. (laughs) No, those are sopranos. Yeah. I think that's a swarm. swarm. Yeah. (laughs) I think that it should be alliterative. It should start with an S, right? So I went through... I I, I don't know that that's true. I don't know that I agree with that, Brad, but (laughs) we can continue in your fantasy. Yes. Well, for the sake of my fantasy, we'll we'll start at the collective noun with an S, like, like school of fish. I, I was looking through a bunch of these. There's a, a suffering, suffering of singers. Oh, that's even better than what a I had. Of sopranos. Suffering of sopranos. Suffering of sopranos. Really yeah. nice. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> yeah, except we're not all sopranos here. Even Nina is a, a mezzo. Yeah, Nina. Have you ever sung any soprano, any high type uh, repertoire, Nina? Well, that's kind of the interesting thing about voices is that no matter how hard we try, we are born with the voices we're born with. So if I wanted to sing the higher repertoire, I I literally, it would be physically impossible for me to to sing anything in the soprano range. Well, that is a definitive answer if I ever heard one, yeah. (laughs) Nina, I told you that uh, we were going to listen to your story. I've got some music to accompany your story. Okay, take it away, Nina. Fabulous. Well, I was born and raised in Southern California, um, where I studied violin for many years and actually ended up um, at Boston University studying violin and psychology. And it wasn't until after I got my uh, undergraduate degree that I decided that singing was something I was interested in. Um, I had sung in high school choir and loved it, but by the time I got to college, I started to focus you know, on other areas of music. Um, And someone heard me singing in a practice room once when I was in college and said, you should really think about getting a master's in voice. And I thought, oh, opera singers? No, I don't want to have anything to do with uh, with opera singers. And um, they convinced me to apply for a master's. And so I got into a master's degree at Boston University where I was uh, awarded a large scholarship. Um, I'd actually been thinking about going and getting a master's in psychology to help people deal with performance anxiety and had gotten in a program for that but had no um, funding available for that. So I thought, well, I can always go back and do psychology later, but I can't necessarily ever go back and do singing later. So I started on my path to becoming a singer and um, I went to Boston University and then Academy of Vocal Arts in Philadelphia 
I now live in Bloomington, Indiana, where my husband, who is a French hornist with the Canadian Brass, teaches at IU. And we have two sons, a 12-year-old and a 7-year-old, and uh, we're based out of the Midwest, and I get to travel a lot all over the United States for work. So that's just a little bit about me. That's a great story. Now, how do your two sons feel about their musical parents? Are, are the kids musical as well? Actually, our older son, who's 12, um, has played twice at Carnegie Hall. He plays piano, and just this last fall, he played a concerto with orchestra um, there, and he's a fabulous pianist. Our younger son is really interested in basketball. He's seven, and he actually said to me the other day, why can't I have normal parents who don't leave home for long periods of time? Oh. <laughs> a little harder for him at such a young age. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at people's facial expressions here in the studio, and you say things like, oh, my son played at Carnegie Hall. Oh, my husband is a hornist for the Canadian brass. You know, everybody's like, wow. <laughs> and, and all your son wants are normal parents. <laughs> exactly. Here's to praising abnormality. <laughs> exactly. I think that kids always think their parents are not normal, right? Mm-hmm. That, Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about uh, your own singing and your own career path. So I actually started undergrad thinking I wanted to be a band director. Okay. And so I was um, at Bowling Green State University on an oboe scholarship, <laughs> but wanted to keep up with voice as well, um, just knowing that in the education field, so many programs are combining both instrumental and um, vocal education into one um, position. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to keep myself as diverse as possible. And throughout um, high school and middle school, I had participated in theater And my sophomore year, I decided to audition for the opera. And so hearing your experience as being a violinist, first and foremost, really spoke to me being an oboist, first and foremost, in my undergrad. Yeah, I I was also an instrumentalist, and I was told that I had to give up instruments to pursue singing. So I didn't Hmm. have that kind of, you know, bilateral approach to my my career when I was What was your instrument? I started on the clarinet. I wanted to play the flute, but I started on the clarinet because they had too many flute players in band. And then I moved to bassoon and played bassoon for a long time. And then I played tenor sax in a jazz band. And it was a sax teacher that said, or it was a voice teacher that said, you got to give up the sax because it messes with your embouchure, you know, for singing. So I regret that we've been at this for six years and I didn't know you were a sax player (laughs) until right now. But back to you, Nina. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about you and your advocacy because that's something that I found when I was looking through your website, Nina. Uh, you founded the uh, Asian Opera Alliance. Can you tell us a little bit about your work as an advocate for Asian singers? Absolutely. So, um, in the spring of 2021, shortly after um, the shootings of Asian women at the salons in Atlanta. We started to see opera companies around the nation posting social media posts saying, you know, we support our Asian artists. And I was tagged in a lot of these posts. And one post uh, specifically um, tagged a bunch of singers. And I looked at it. And first and foremost, they tagged the wrong Asian soprano. We had done this several times and they tagged the wrong, wrong person in this in the second production. And, you know, it it got me thinking, uh, well, this is this whole, you know, this whole stereotype, all Asians look the same, right? And then as I started to look at these pictures, the other thing I realized is that every single Asian singer uh, was, uh, had been cast into solely Asian roles. There were no Asian Mm -hmm. singers in this post um, that had sung anything other than Mm -hmm. say like Madam Butterfly or Turandot. Mm -hmm. And so I called a friend and I said, You know, this is the next step for opera. We need to stop pigeonholing our Asian artists. And she asked me, well, Nina, in in a typical season, how many um, non-Asian roles do you sing? And I started thinking about it, and I hadn't thought about it myself even. And um, I started going back. And it wasn't in a typical season, but it was in 10 years. I had only sung three non-Asian roles in that time. 
over 150 uh, Suzuki's and Madame Butterfly. There's a lot of contemporary opera that um, features Asian and Asian American stories. So I've done a lot of that, plus, you know, tons of concert work, but only three non-Asian roles. And I myself was shocked to find that out. And I thought, well, if I didn't even know how bad it had become, how was anyone else supposed to know? You know, I'm, yeah. I'm self-employed. I go from place to place to place. It's not like, you know, I go to one opera company and then they keep following my career and watch what I do in a season. I go there and then I'm forgotten until the next time they do Madam Butterfly or whatever. So I thought, okay, it's, it's time to start speaking up because people don't know what's happening to Asian singers in the United States. And to be honest, um, pigeonholing is a form of racism. Yeah. And that's not okay. So that was the beginnings of the Asian Opera Alliance. Well, folks can find information about this and also read a really fascinating uh, Time article that is all on your website, along with a video related to that article that I talked about. And we want to tell people what your website is. It is uh, Nina, which is spelled N-I-N-A, Yoshida, Y-O-S-H-I-D-A, Nelson, N-E-L-S-E-N, Dot com. Did I get that correct, Nina? You got that correct. I've got one name, Nina, that everyone pronounces as Nina, and <laughs> one name, Nelson, that everyone spells N-E-L-S-O-N, but, you know, my husband decided to spell it N-E-L-S-E-N, and <laughs> sometimes it's hard to find me. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we got you, at least for the time being, and we're going to also have you Friday night. Um, I should mention that concert is happening again at the Peristyle, the Toledo Museum of Art. It's at 8 o'clock p.m. Nina Yoshida Nelson is singing with the Toledo Symphony, and uh, guest conductor Daniela Candelari is making her debut with the uh, Toledo Symphony. I mean, she's no slouch as a conductor. She's working with the New York Philharmonic, conducted at the Met recently. And you can find information about this program at ToledoSymphony.com, or you can call them up at 419-246-8000. Well, Nina, I'm so relieved that you're not singing Madam Butterfly with the Toledo Symphony <laughs> Orchestra. Yeah. Otherwise, it would yeah. be an uncomfortable conversation. But you are bringing Alma Mahler songs to the, uh, to the stage of the Paris style. Have you sung any of her songs before? You know, I haven't. I think when you hear the name Mahler, you think of her husband, Gustav, right? And uh, and she was much... Sorry, I had to throw in that Mahler bell for Zach, because you said Gustav Mahler. We're making a separation between Alma and Gustav, You don't right? have an Alma bell? I don't have an Alma bell. Well, now you have your homework. Maybe by the end of the podcast, <laughs> I'll come up with an Alma bell. At any rate, I didn't mean to, to interrupt you, Nina. You were saying? Right. So she's she's much less well-known for her composing. Um, as I was doing some research, uh, it's thought that she may have composed up to 50 um, songs for piano and voice, of which um, about 15 remain today. Um, and so I'm singing six of these songs, a group of four songs that is, is fairly well known, and then an additional two songs um, that have been orchestrated. So normally we hear her music just with voice and piano, mm -hmm. but in this case, we will be hearing it with orchestra as well, which is really exciting. They're not done uh, very often, if you know, hardly ever. So this will be a, a treat to to be able to do. Yeah, it, it, these these are gorgeous songs. I've honestly never heard them orchestrated, so I'm very excited for this performance. I've only heard them uh, sung with piano. Um, but the, uh, I mean, she was an outstanding composer. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I, Nana, I can't wait to hear you sing these songs. Um, because it, it, along with all of the music on this program, every one of these notes deserves a much wider audience. Yeah. Well, Alma Mahler, you know, a very complicated and interesting figure who lived for another 50 years after her husband Gustav passed away, um, you know, went back to composing and wrote a lot of this music that we're going to hear post Mahler, as it were. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a really interesting, uh, interesting program. There are some who say that um, there is no music after Mahler. 
I would say that in her case, there deserves to be wonderful music, and it's yeah. hers. I'm very, very excited about it. Well, you, it depends on which Mahler you're talking about. Well, it does get complicated, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you still with us, Nina? I'm still here, yeah. Excellent. I have a quiz. Let's do part of our oh, quiz, okay? This is a quiz that ties into this uh, women in classical music theme. This is called the Female Firsts Quiz. And basically, I'm going to ask you questions like, who was the first woman to et cetera, et cetera, right? And I'll give, you, I'll give you three choices. Uh, you choose what you think is correct. And we're going to run through four questions first and the possible answers. Then we'll go back and uh, double check and see how everybody did. Now, this is the honor system, Nina. So if you, you know, answer something uh, incorrectly, you have to let us know. If you want. Otherwise, you can just say you got them all, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. You hadn't thought of that, had you? I think you're encouraging yeah. uh, misbehavior here, Cresswell. Yeah, that's what we do on Symphony Lab. Is that? Okay. Let me pull up I some. I thought you were allowed to like, do a Google search as we were sitting here. And, I and... <laughs> as long as you're a quiet typer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, if you go over and say, hey, Siri, who is the first... <laughs> <laughs> then we'll know. <laughs> That's an idea. That's an idea. Okay, let me pull up some music. All right. That's an arrangement, of course, of the Habanera from the Opera Carmen. All right, your first question is, who was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize? Was it Florence Nightingale? Was it Marie Curie? Or was it Jane Addams? A, B, or C? Your second question, who was the first woman to become a U.S. Supreme Court Justice? Would that be Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sandra Day O'Connor, or Amy Beach? A, B, or C? Boy, if you miss that one, I don't know. Okay, third question, who was the first woman to win an Academy Award for Best Director? Was that Catherine Bigelow? Was it Sofia Coppola? Or was it Jane Campion? A, B, or C. Final question for this round. Who was the first woman to become the prime minister of a country? Was it Indira Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher, or Golda Meir? A, B, or C. Now, those questions weren't too hard, were they? W what do you think, Nina? Well, um, you know, I'm not that great with my, my history, but hopefully I got at least one right. We'll see. <laughs> Okay, let's go back. The first woman to win a Nobel Prize, Florence Nightingale, Marie Curie, or Jane Addams. It was B, Marie Curie. Now, by Yay! a show of hands. You got that one, Nina? I did. Yeah, did everybody else get it? Yeah, everybody got it. That's great. Yay! Okay, you're all tied. Second question. Who was the first woman to become a U.S. Supreme Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sandra Day O'Connor, or Amy Beach? The answer is Amy Beach. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is B, Sandra Day O'Connor. Did everybody get that? Mm -hmm. Yes? Raise your hands. How would you do with that one, Nina? I did not get that one. You did I, not? Uh, or, no. You chose Amy Beach. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, nine is still in the lead. We're going to you're going to win the quiz anyway cuz you're the guest. Okay. What's the prize? <laughs> you have to wait and see. You okay. get to sing Alma Mahler songs. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Who was the first woman to win an Academy Award for Best Director? Was it Catherine Bigelow, was it Sofia Coppola, or Jane Campion? The answer is A, Catherine Bigelow for The Hurt Locker. Everybody get that? They all got it here. How'd you do, Nina? <laughs> I didn't. I also, I'm being so truthful here, and it's very embarrassing, but I also, I guess, be on that one as well. Yay! <laughs> so, Nina still has the lead. Yep. Yes, indeed. <laughs> all right, last question for this part of the quiz. Who was the first woman to become the prime minister of a country? Was it Indira Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher, or Golda Meir? The answer is C, Golda Meir. Did everybody get that here? Oh, yeah. man. I didn't. <laughs> See, I don't know if they're telling me the truth in the studio or not. I can look at them and judge by their faces, but they all raise their hands. Oh, and I, say I put my thumb way down on Oh, that. your thumb was down. <laughs> yep. Okay, so you didn't get it. <laughs> Nina, did you get it? I, yes or no? I got 
No, I guess Margaret Thatcher. Oh, <laughs> wow. That's another. Come on. Okay, well, Nina is in the lead, all right? Awesome, awesome. So we'll save the rest of the quiz for a little bit later, but let me ask you, Nina, have you ever been to Toledo or sung here or done anything here in the past? I don't think so. You know, you're you're actually pretty close to me in Indiana, right down the street. But um, yeah. I, I've driven through Ohio a lot because I went to school in Pennsylvania and my husband was already living in, in Indiana. So we would drive back and forth. But I haven't stopped very much in Ohio, actually. Yeah, well, we're glad you're going to stop this time. Anybody have any, any non-musical recommendations for, for Nina when she's here? Coffee, I love, I, I'm a coffee addict, so I'll take any coffee recommendation. Best coffee in, in the Toledo area. What do you say, Zach? Um Well, it, it, there would be a couple uh, downtown not too far from uh, the hotels or the, the performance space. Uh, folks seem to like Maddie and Bella, which is a great coffee shop on uh, South Huron Street. And then there's uh, Rust Belt Coffee, which is on Ontario, not far from um, from Maddie and Bella, in fact. So uh, if you don't like one, go to the other. And if you like them both, you'll have plenty of <laughs> opportunities. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Liz, you, you probably, you know, will have to tell Nina where to go when she gets here uh, for coffee houses. So do you accept uh, what Zach has to say or do you have anything to add to I that? I agree with what Zach says and that's... Usually yeah. where I tend to schedule oh, his coffee that's meetings. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, what do you say, Mickey? <laughs> I like Black Kite down the road on Collingwood, too. Black Kite? Good. All right, now you've got three different coffee uh, shops. Okay. That, uh, so you've... I will give them all a, a try. I also travel with my own coffee setup as well um, oh. in case. You know, so Paired I I have so many questions. Do do you like do you like pull up to the hotel and like pull your espresso machine out? Do do you have to get like um this one is of the coffee, porters to coffee help? Coffee podcast, right? Yeah, I yeah. I just imagine that would be very heavy. Yeah, so I uh, I have a a collapsible kettle um, and a um, what they call an AeroPress, which is pretty mm-hmm. small, and I usually travel with one uh, bag of beans that's already been ground, and then I'll find a place whenever I, you know, because as an opera singer, I, I show up in a in a town, and normally I'm there for a month or longer, right? Mm-hmm. So going out to coffee every day is is not financially feasible. Um, so, so I make sure, but I also am kind of such a snob about it, that I want to make sure that I've got good coffee to drink every day. Yeah. So. We'll make sure to have Folgers instant crystals in your dressing room. <laughs> That'll be on your performance writer, a, a bag of beans. I'm wondering what the collective noun should be for beans, like a bevy of beans or a boodle um, of beans. A, a, a bloating of beans. A bloating of beans. Yeah. Very good. Well, we've talked about all kinds of things on this podcast. I mean, we've talked about craft beer and lots of things. So, you know, we're widening our scope here to include coffee. Thank you, Nina, for (laughs) joining our discussion today. Does anybody have any questions for Nina? It can be about, you know, the song she's singing, or it can just be about singing in general. I mean, we have a few singers on the panel here. What what would you like to to know? I would be curious... um... You know, I'm I'm really excited for these Mahler songs, um, and I, in part because we don't often get to hear them. I'm curious if there is other repertoire, especially with orchestra, that you have on your wish list to perform or that you wish you got to hear more? Um, that I have on my wish list to perform. There's always <laughs> two that are there that I'm like, yes, please bring it on. Um, and you can get your bell ready for this. Uh, <laughs> Gustav Mahler's uh, second symphony is just, you know, nice. it's just divine, that mezzo solo. Um, and then, uh, of course, the Verdi Requiem, which I have performed several times. Um, yeah. But it's such another incredible piece. Um, those are those are my two that I would sing every day if I could. Um you know, uh, Messiah, not so much, but uh, I think there's a lot. <laughs> well, there's a lot of laughter. Or George. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of music that um, that I do perform that that is, I do a lot of new music. So, you know, getting to especially um, to work with composers of color, female composers of color. You know, I'm always looking to lift up uh, composers that 
maybe haven't been given um, as much recognition as they should have. Yeah. Um, what about you, Elizabeth? Do you have uh, any kind of a question for Nina? So going off of what you just said, can you please list some composers that you've been working with that you really want to lift up their voices that we might not know as well? Absolutely. Um, one of one of my favorite contemporary um, composers is Huang Ro, and he's written mm. several operas as well as um, as well as a bunch of symphonic work. And um, he's based out of New York and is a, is an incredible advocate for Asian Americans in the arts. So he's he's one of my one of my nearest and dearest people that I, I like to perform his music. Well, I mean, that's a name that anybody who is associated with new music would know. And Mickey, mm -hmm. I know you have a bit of a pedigree singing modern music and new music. I do. It's, it's very exactly to Nina's point. It's such a joy to get to work with folks that are alive and collaborative, and you can get to know not only their perspective, but you can collaborate in so many exciting ways. Yeah. Um, I'm eager to hear those pieces. Well, it's Love good those. until they say that you did a bad job, which... <laughs> well, you know, art's subjective. Yes, yes. <laughs> I remember one time I sang a, a piece by uh, Michael Tippett while he was alive. That's dating me a little bit, but um, I, I just was all over the place and couldn't get all the notes and all the special effects that were in the score, and I apologized to him afterwards, and he was like, oh, you got the feeling of it. It was fine. Not yeah. to worry, you know, so so that was an example of somebody who was, you know, very empathetic. When Which it came of these to... extended techniques would you like me to yes. do on this piece? <laughs> I looked in the score and said, barking like a dog, and I knew it was all downhill from there. <laughs> Nina, have you ever uh, uh, had to, to use kind of extended techniques that Mickey is talking about in, in, in your music? and Well, not your music, yeah. your performance. Yeah, not so much, not so much. Um, but I actually had a really exciting experience uh, just last week. Um, I've been involved in an opera called An American Dream by Jack Perla and Jessica Murphy Moo since it premiered in Seattle in 2015. And actually, they um, it centers on a Japanese American family who's incarcerated during World War II. And um, they wrote my aria for me after interviewing my grandmother after her experiences um, oh, wow. of being incarcerated. So yeah. I've performed in most of the productions of this show, not all, but most. And um, I performed it last week in my hometown in Santa Barbara, California. And, you know, like as you, as you were saying about working with living composers and librettists, um, the last time we, I performed this was last year in Kentucky, and after I, I got together with the composer and librettist who have since become dear friends of mine, and I said, you know, there are several things that just don't quite work in this opera. Now this opera's been around for almost 10 years. Like, we should really make some adjustments. And they were like, yeah, let's do it. And so last week, we premiered a brand new scene in this opera, um, you know, eight years later after its premiere. Um, oh. So there's something to be said for for getting to work with living and have and have relationships with living composers well we're going to hear you singing some of the songs of alma mahler on friday it's happening at eight o'clock p.m at the paris style at the toledo museum of art more information at toledosymphony.com or the box office number 419-246-8000 our guest mezzo soprano nina yoshida nelson is performing along with guest conductor daniela candelari we're going to hear, in addition to those Alma Mahler songs, music of Jessie Montgomery, which uh, she's been performed by the symphony a few times in the past, but this is a fairly recent piece that mm -hmm. she wrote for the uh, Chicago Symphony, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to hear that work. And also, I'm excited to hear the Symphony Number no. 3 of Louise Ferenc, who is a wonderful composer that we don't get to, to hear all that often. Yeah. Zach, you're you're nodding. Uh, Alain Trudel is the one who introduced me to the symphony, and it's a phenomenal, phenomenal piece, and yeah. uh, it 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 pays homage to so many amazing composers. It shows such an amazing compositional technique. It's very creative. It's dark and turns to light, and it's just an outstanding piece. Yeah, we look forward to that. Louis Ferenc, a composer of the 19th century, mm -hmm. basically. Um, I like how this program is spaced out. You've got Jesse Montgomery, who is a living 
a composer active right now, and then you have Alma Mahler, who's sort of at the very end of the 19th century into the 20th century. She died in 64, I think. Mm -hmm. And then you have Louise Ferenc, who is firmly ensconced mm -hmm. in, the, in the 19th century. So there's a little bit of a progression, you know, as far as uh, the music is concerned. But Louise Ferenc, you know, I play a lot of her chamber music, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard her symphonies that often. Well, so. She wrote that great Nanette. I yeah. presume you play that. Right. Um, right. Which is not No No Nanette. No, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> I can see you. That was the I first thing that came to mind. I'm just constantly tap dancing. <laughs> no, no. It, no, no, please don't. <laughs> no, no. No, no, Nanette. I played no. <laughs> uh, but, you know, as a, as a symphonist, um, you know, she was writing at a time when, um, if you were a French composer, you better be writing operas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, right. Just, and so, throwing some dance in the boot. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, she was she was against the grain uh, in several ways, but uh, she was an outstanding symphonist. And, um, I mean, and you have to think about when she was writing too. You know, um, yeah. you know, Mendelssohn was was dead. Um, Brahms, I think, was a teenager. Uh, Schumann, I think, was still alive, but it had written his better stuff already. So, yeah, um, it was just a, a great opening for her to to write some amazing symphonic works. Well, now I'm sure that you'll agree, looking at this program, that it is a, a, a wonderful survey, sort of uh, female composers throughout the years. Mm. Yeah, I think that you know, in in classical music, women have kind of been left behind for quite a while, and it's it's really exciting to to see um, female composers getting you know the acclaim that they deserve. Uh, I would love to see it you know more widely throughout the United States, and and as more you know, we're fifty one percent of the population here, right? Like, why aren't we? highlighting uh, females more often. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, as I said before, that's an entire episode unto itself, but uh -huh. definitely a, a question worth considering uh, by people who are going to go see this wonderful concert. I, I have a few more quiz questions, so we're going to finish out with uh, the second part of my quiz. You're doing this to me again? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you can hang up at any time. <laughs> You could just say, oh, I had phone problems, sorry. She had can't to give go. up the lead. Yeah, can't just say, up. oh, look at the time, got to run. All right, let me pull up some uh, music here. Wow, this oh. is quite different from your last quiz music. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. What, what part of What part of Bizet is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is the unknown Bizet. <laughs> okay. Who was the first woman to win a Grammy Award for Song of the Year? Was it Carol King? Was it Carly Simon or was it Joni Mitchell? Okay, second question. Who was the first woman to win an Academy Award for Best Actress? Was it Janet Gaynor, Betty Davis, or Katharine Hepburn, A, B, or C? Third question. Speaking of classical composers, who was the first woman to conduct the London Philharmonic Orchestra? Was it Imogene Holst, was it Nadia Boulanger, or was it Jane Glover? And the final question, who was the first woman to conduct at the Metropolitan Opera? Was it Sarah Caldwell, was it Simone Young, or Antonia Brico? A, B, or C? Okay, let's go back to the beginning. Who was the first woman to win a Grammy for Song of the Year? The answer was A, Carol King. Yeah? Yes, you won that! <laughs> Zach, Zach is making a scrunchy face. You're the only one who didn't get that one, Zach. No, I am. I am absolutely the only one who didn't get that. Okay. That buzzer's for you. All right. <laughs> second question: Who was the first woman to win an Academy Award for Best Actress? Janet Gaynor, Betty Davis, or Katharine Hepburn? The answer is in 1929, Janet Gaynor won for not one, not two, but three different silent films. She was awarded Best Actress. For that, so Zach got that one. Are we at the inverse now? You did. You, yeah, it's our scrunchy face. Thumbs down. down. <laughs> How would you do, Nina? Did you get that one? Yeah, no. <laughs> wow. You guys really need to watch more old movies. Yeah, I, I had uh -oh. a, a suspicion that Zach would get that one. She's right. the only silent film actress, so I mean, yeah. There you go. Okay, who was the first woman to conduct the London Philharmonic Orchestra? 
Uh, was it Ima Jean Holst? Was it Nadia Boulanger or Jane Glover? The answer was B, Nadia Boulanger. Yay! You got that? Did you get it, Mickey? I got an answer. <laughs> just say yes, no. <laughs> She's just such a phenomenal teacher that... Yeah. Yeah. She also conducted the Toledo Symphony. Oh. Really? Mm-hmm. When was that? style. Uh, 40s. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, a lot of uh, luminaries have come through the stage of the peristyle. We were talking about Igor Stravinsky, who played here mm-hmm. with Samuel Yushkin when they mm-hmm. were on tour. Aaron Copeland. Aaron mm-hmm. Copeland, yeah. Nina Boulanger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and also uh, Nina Yoshida Nelson. She's going to be right. here as well. Yeah, we'll put you in the same category. Um, amazing. Thank <laughs> All right, last question. Who was the first woman to conduct at the Metropolitan Opera? Sarah Caldwell, Simone Young, or Antonia Brico? All three had a first conducting a symphony. The answer to the Metropolitan Opera question was A, Sarah Caldwell. She was the first woman to conduct at the Met. Did you get that, Zach? No, I thought that was the Harry. (laughs) (laughs) The red herring, right? Let's, yeah. I chose C. You chose C. I also chose C. Everybody chose C. Antonia Brico, she was the first woman to conduct the the New York Philharmonic, actually. Not the first woman at the Met. Simone Young was the first woman to conduct at the Vienna Philharmonic. Can you guess what what year that she was? (laughs) 1999? (laughs) No, much later than that, actually, yeah. In 2005, she became the first woman at the helm of the Vienna Philharmonic. I think that kind of speaks for itself, right? And the winner of the quiz is... Nina, put your hands together. So how do you feel being a Symphony Lab quiz champion, Nina? Yeah, I would like to thank the Academy. And <laughs> <laughs> well, we've really appreciated having you here with us uh, for Symphony Lab. We look forward to your performance, music of uh, Alma Mahler with the symphony. That's coming up on Friday at 8 p.m. at the Peristyle. More information at ToledoSymphony.com or 419-246-8000. Nina, I know that uh, your time is at a premium you have to run but we've enjoyed having you and enjoyed the discussion and we really look forward to having you here i can't wait to be there thanks so much this program is a production of wgte public media in collaboration with our sponsor the toledo symphony with generous support from the rita barber kern foundation you can download episodes as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org slash lab You can also subscribe to us through your podcast app of choice, including Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts. Don't forget to check out all the upcoming events at the Symphony by visiting their website at ToledoSymphony.com and their various social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find the TSO's streaming platform online at stream.artstoledo.com. My thanks to Zach Vasser, Elizabeth Fogel, Mickey Emsch, and also to our special guest, Nina Yoshida Nelson. I'm Brad Cresswell. This has been Toledo Symphony Lab from FM 81.